One of my favorite things to do in film criticism is to rewatch an old movie that I used to have very strong opinions about one way or another to see if I still feel the same way. I've been meaning to do this with the Pirates of the Caribbean trilogy, the first three movies directed by Gore Verbinski, for a while now. Because those movies seem to have reputations that are set in stone. Everybody loves the first movie because it's a lean little action adventure movie with zero fat on it, a perfect movie that doesn't require any work from the audience to enjoy. It's got romance, it's got action, it's got comedy. It's the ultimate throw it on when you're tired movie and you will be teleported two hours into the future completely refreshed. And then there's the two sequels, which are really one long movie that you need to set aside an entire evening to enjoy and which require you to bust out a notepad to keep track of all the characters. But you know what? I think we were spoiled in the 2000s. In the 2000s, we were getting big blockbuster movies directed by weird auteur filmmakers that came out of nowhere literally every year. Movies that were wildly tonally different, well-made, and memorable. Now, I don't want to romanticize the past as if all the movies back then were great. They weren't. But when looking back at these two movies, movies that have been widely derided for two decades, watching them in the context of today's media landscape is a very different experience. And actually, I think if they had come out today, they would be some of the most celebrated blockbusters of the year. I think the best way to address why people didn't connect with these movies as much as they did with the first one is by answering the question, what do each of the main characters want? In the first movie, that question is really easy to answer. Will wants to save Elizabeth because he loves her. What's-his-name also wants to save Elizabeth. Elizabeth is just trying to survive, but then wants to save Will. Barbosa wants to collect the Aztec gold so that he can eat an apple again. And Jack wants revenge on Barbosa for initiating a mutiny against him. Pretty simple stuff. Okay, now what do the characters want in the two sequels? Well, Cutler Beckett wants Will to steal Jack Sparrow's compass so that he can use it to find Davy Jones's heart, so he can use that to control Davy Jones himself, which will give the East India Company total control of the seas. Jack Sparrow wants to escape the bargain he made with Davy Jones, but fails to do it, dies, comes back to life, and then wants to get Davy Jones's heart so that he can replace Jones as the captain of the Flying Dutchman and live forever. Will Turner again just wants to save Elizabeth at the start, but then also wants to free his father from Davy Jones's crew, which leads to him scheming to take control of the Black Pearl because it's the only ship faster than the Dutchman, but when that fails, he schemes with the bad guys to sell it to pirates on the promise of securing Elizabeth and his father's safety. Elizabeth wants to save Will at first, but then she wants to get revenge on Cutler Beckett for killing her father, leading her to push the Brethren Court of Pirates to war with the East India Company. What's-his-name wants to regain his position in the British Navy and does so by giving Beckett the heart, but then regrets having done this and tries to redeem himself by helping Elizabeth escape, resulting in his death. Davy Jones wants to maintain control over the chest that contains his heart because he dies if anybody stabs it, and he also wants to get back his ex-girlfriend, the literal personification of the ocean, Calypso. Calypso, also known as Tia Dalma, wants to get herself freed by the Brethren Court, which cast magic on her that bound her to a human form. So she needs the Brethren Court to get together, declare war, and then burn all the little items that they use to bind her so that she can be free again. When she learns that Davy Jones was the one behind her imprisonment, she wants revenge on him, creating a maelstrom that eventually consumes him. Barbosa has been Turn from the dead and kinda has to do what Calypso says, so his goals are essentially just an extension of hers. So, you've got a pair of extremely hyperactive movies that have twice as many significant characters, and almost all of them have their central motivations and loyalties change completely over the course of the story, which is just a lot for an audience to keep track of. But, in the context of today's media landscape, where we have 20 movies existing in the same universe where multiple monocultural franchises require audiences to be familiar with literally hundreds of characters, the pirate sequels are damn near basic. Oh, they're too long? How dare you say that after your 13-hour Stranger Things binge? One of the most unfortunate trends in the film industry over the last 10 years or so is the death of comedy films. You know, once upon a time, a bunch of comedians would get together and make comedies, or romantic comedies, and they would be some of the most successful movies of the year. Do you remember that? There's a lot of reasons for this decline, though. Generally, comedies are mid-budget, and mid-budget movies as a whole have declined. The last time a pure comedy movie cracked the top 10 highest grossing movies of the year domestically was 2009 with The Hangover. Yeah. 
It's been more than a decade since a regular old comedy movie has been able to compete with the big noise action genre mashup roller coasters. So most movies are now either made for $5 and a dream, or cost more than the GDP of some countries. Mid-budget movies, on the other hand, often made a lot of their revenue on DVD or Blu-ray sales, which have dried up as a result of the rise of streaming. At the same time, the only companies that seem interested in pumping out comedy movies are those very same streaming services that killed them in the first place. But to quote Quentin Tarantino on this, Ryan Reynolds has made $50 million on this movie, and $50 million on that movie, and $50 million on the next movie for them. I don't know what any of those movies are. I've never seen them. Have you? Those movies don't exist in the zeitgeist. It's almost like they don't even exist. But it's not just all of the factors I've listed out so far that's caused this. It's that big noise movies are usually comedies too, at least ostensibly. Americans only go to the theaters a few times a year, so I can't really fault them for choosing the movies where they get both jokes and explosions instead of just jokes. The dominant player here is of course Marvel, and I think the MCU's specific kind of humor is also partially responsible for killing even the lowest of low-budget comedies, parody movies. In the 2000s, we used to have this whole little industry of films that mocked whatever was popular at the box office. They weren't that good, but at least they existed. Like, how could you ever make one today when the thing that is the most popular at the box office is the Marvel Cinematic Universe? How could David Zucker ever make fun of this when it already looks like a David Zucker movie? The point is, every year, while comedy movies don't make the top 10 earning movies of the year, action comedies always do. Because when you break it down, the biggest movies of the year are genre mashups, but they usually only wear the clothes of other genres, so to speak. And this is why I want to get to the Pirates movies, because while modern films have action scenes and they have comedy scenes, they don't often have action comedy scenes. What do I mean by that? I mean scenes where the premise of the action is comedic, where the comedy escalates over the course of the action scene, where the comedy isn't just coming from characters making quippy one-liners over one another, but where the visual presentation of the action is inherently funny itself. So for the sake of this video, I endured the two-hour runtime of Ant-Man Quantumania. In one of the scenes, you have two people with technology that can shrink or expand things fighting against Bill Murray at an alien bar, and to get away, they make a weird octopus turn really big and it eats Bill Murray. This should be the funniest scene in the movie. This should be the funniest scene of the year. But the images are somehow so bland that they pass without leaving any impression whatsoever. It just sort of happens and then they move on to the next thing. The camera doesn't frame the action in a way that's comedic. The scene doesn't mind the premise for every possible joke it could. It's just there. But the pattern this movie falls into, that almost all of the Marvel movies not directed by James Gunn fall into, is having the characters make jokes, then have a beat of action. Then the characters make jokes about the action, but the action isn't funny itself. But the Pirates movies? Peak action comedy. Now, despite the fact that the first movie is the one that pretty much everyone agrees is the best of the franchise, going back and watching it now made me realize that the extremely kinetic action that the franchise is often remembered for didn't really originate in that movie. It's Dead Man's Chest and At World's End where the Pirates films hit their action comedy apex. So let's establish a few things that good action comedy does. The way the images are framed by the camera is the most essential part of this. There are some kinds of shots that are just reliably funny. I don't want to say inherently funny because comedy is subjective, but if you have watched enough movies, you will recognize them as moments where the filmmakers are trying to make you laugh. For instance, have something in the background of a shot undermine what is happening in the foreground. Gore Verbinski does this constantly in his movies. In this shot, in The Mexican, for instance, people steal Brad Pitt's car in the background while he is on the phone in the foreground. In The Lone Ranger, an intense fight in the foreground is undermined by Tonto climbing a ladder in the background. In Dead Man's Chest, Jack pulls himself out of an open grave in the foreground while a giant wheel rolls toward him in the background. This is basically about putting the setup and the payoff of a joke in the same image and creating anticipation in the audience for it. Here's another instance of it in the same sequence. While Elizabeth is in danger in the foreground, the silly three-way fight on the big wheel rolls by in the background, which is another point about framing. Whenever things unexpectedly or quickly enter or leave the frame, the audience interprets it as a joke. This actually happens twice in that Elizabeth scene. First with the big wheel and then with the... <laughs> Here's another example of it in another Gore Verbinski movie, Rango. <laughs> Oh no, Elizabeth is in trouble again. 
These kinds of jokes are enhanced by a particular kind of shot that often has very little camera movement and where the camera is held level to the ground. This creates a kind of play-like look where things are able to come on or off stage. Comedy shots also often pull back to make the protagonists look small, and when things are small, our brains seem to think that that's funny. Like when Will and What's-His-Face are fighting here and the camera is pointing up at them, they look awesome. When it's a flat shot and they're far away, it looks funny. I often think about this shot from Dead Man's Chest where six men fall to their deaths. You could film that scene in a hundred different ways to a hundred different effects. Like imagine if the camera showed us the POV of the people inside the cage in their final moments. That would be horrifying. But because we have an overhead shot, it reads as a joke. Because look at them get small, suckers. All of these techniques and more are on constant display during both the major action comedy scenes of the sequels. The rolling ball scene and the rolling wheel scene. Is there something just inherently funny about things rolling? I mean, I don't need to do any analysis to say that this shot is awesome. Another big part of this is the union between music and editing. The Pirates movies have one of the liveliest soundtracks out there. But it isn't just that the music is good, it's that the music is used with a purpose, and the movie is edited to the beat. Here, Jack Sparrow swings up to the sails of a ship, and the horns come in right when his feet touch the wood. I know that this sounds like the most basic thing in the world, but I actually think it is a hugely underrated reason for why people did not connect with the later Pirates movies that weren't helmed by Verbinski. The music in those movies does not as reliably capture the tone of the action, and will often repurpose old themes without much care for what that music originally meant. Like, the fourth movie opens with what should be a fanciful little escape scene, but the music has an unearned intensity to it. But the original trilogy is flawless on this note. I can't describe it any other way than that when the music plays and I'm watching people swing swords, I want to be swinging a sword too. Everything that I've described in this section though takes a lot of time, planning, and coordination to pull off. And these are things that a lot of modern productions struggle with. For instance, it's no surprise the action and the comedy of a Marvel movie don't feel like they overlap because from a production perspective, they pretty much never did. Marvel often has second unit directors who handle the action while the credited directors work on the rest of the movie. There's still many great examples of modern action comedy though, particularly in animated features. And last year's best picture winner, Everything Everywhere All at Once was masterful at marrying action and comedy. But I do think it's something that we're seeing less of. And the Pirates trilogy, particularly Dead Man's Chest, did it in ways that are still memorable and unique. Whatever qualms I have about the writing of these two movies are usually silenced when I'm watching three dudes fight on a giant wheel. Another trend that has permeated major Hollywood blockbusters is an aversion to sex and sex appeal. Apart from the obligatory topless shot they put in the trailers that tricks women into thinking every action movie will somehow feel like Magic Mike, big blockbusters have become pretty sterile on this front. This trend exists alongside an audience backlash against any depiction of sex in this kind of entertainment. If you've glanced at Twitter in the last year or two, you've almost certainly seen one viral tweet or another decrying the need for sex scenes in any movies whatsoever. The typical reason given for this is that sex scenes are indulgent and they don't push the plot forward. But I think those are overly general claims. Yes, sex scenes can be indulgent, but so can literally any other kind of scene. We don't need to see John Wick kill every single henchman in every single John Wick movie, but isn't that why you came? If all that mattered to an audience was moving the plot forward, then reading a Wikipedia summary of a movie would be the same as watching it. And while sex scenes may not always push the plot forward, it's obviously possible to write them in ways that do, in ways that show us more about the characters. Sex is a fundamental part of our humanity, and denying it a place in our stories makes them less authentic experiences. But what's funniest to me about all this howling against sex scenes is that 
Again, it's happening at a time when those kinds of scenes are already largely absent. According to a 2019 report in Playboy, using IMDb data, sex in cinema in the 2010s was at its lowest point since the 1960s. While sex scenes are more common in TV series, they've disappeared from bigger Hollywood movies for a few reasons, one of which is the same reason why there are fewer comedies now, the death of the mid-budget movie. Mid-budget dramas were typically where this kind of scene lived, and those have been dried out of the industry. Since tentpole films are made for all audiences, all ages, and all international markets, sex and sex appeal have often been the first things that are tamped down on in order to broaden that appeal. And then there's the Pirates movies. Movies so horny they need to be locked in a labyrinth. What service may I do you? Though this isn't without its drawbacks, the one moment I genuinely despise from these movies is when Elizabeth gets upskirted at the start of the third film, a throwaway joke that undermines her otherwise strong characterization. I don't think I'm overstating things to say that Elizabeth Swan is a genre-defining character, what all action-adventure heroines aspire to be. Just to give you an idea of how significant she is, on the Wikipedia page for Swashbucklers, they give a list of 76 examples of the archetype, and while this is by no means a definitive list, only six of the examples are women. Characters like Elizabeth are rare, and when they are attempted, they are rarely as well drawn as her. She transcends all of the negative tropes typically associated with women in Swashbucklers. She might begin as the traditional noble lady who the hero aspires to court, but that is far from her only purpose in the story. And while she can scheme just as well as the other pirates, she's not a lying femme fatale. Elizabeth could also just have been a damsel in distress, but instead she always gets herself out of trouble and then saves the men who are there to rescue her. But in a way where the shithead anti-woke brigade never even realized it was subverting that trend in the first place. She enters the world of piracy in the most vulnerable of positions, captured and made to wear flimsy dresses, but then she gets free, puts some pants on, and becomes the Pirate King. What an arc. And sex is an essential part of her development and why her character resonated with audiences. The question of Elizabeth's sexual awakening is actually central to the entire plot of the trilogy. Remember, these movies start when Elizabeth falls off a cliff into the sea and the Aztec coin sends a message to Barbosa that leads to the sack of Port Royal and everything to follow. But why does Elizabeth fall off a cliff? Well, because she was feeling faint when Admiral Watts's face proposed to her, and because she was wearing a corset that was too tight. The demands of femininity and womanhood are literally strangling her, and so it's at sea that Elizabeth finds identity and agency. The second movie starts with her wedding being interrupted by Will's arrest, so the question of how Elizabeth will grow up into a woman is constantly at the center of the narrative, the real stakes of the films. There isn't an explicit sex scene in the Pirates trilogy, but sex permeates all three films in ways that movies of this budget simply don't anymore. There are three movies of build-up to Elizabeth having sex, but when she finally does have sex, it's her pleasure that is the focus. At World's End is the only Disney movie that ends with the implication that the main character is getting head. How can you hate these movies? On top of all that, I am genuinely in awe of how seriously the Pirates movies take the romance in this trilogy. Like sure, they can be fun and silly genre trash in other places, but when Will and Elizabeth are looking at each other, Hans Zimmer scores it like he's making fucking War and Peace. It's been 15 years since At World's End came out, and I don't know if there's another blockbuster film that achieves the kind of breathless yearning like these movies did. The Pirates trilogy are some of the best looking blockbuster films of all time. They are right up there with The Lord of the Rings at the top of the mountain. The fight choreography is great, the stunts are great, the locations are eye-popping, and just look at the color saturation in these images. The movies have greens that are greener than the money I get to explain this stuff to you, and blues that are bluer than the other money I get paid to explain this stuff to you. I'm Canadian, my money is all different colors. I know this might be a weird thing to comment on since even an episode of Survivor can point a camera at an island and crank the color saturation up, but the point is that most big movies don't do this and constantly go for this desaturated gray-blue look. Watch 10 movies that came out in the last year and then watch a scene from the Pirates movies and it will feel like the freshest breath of air your eyeball lungs have ever breathed. On top of that, let's talk about the CGI and motion capture in this movie. To date, I still think Davy Jones is the most convincing computer-generated character ever put to screen. Every part of him is believable. He's intimidating and slimy and fully realized. More than that, he's used appropriately within the environments 
that the CGI is enhanced rather than being distracting. Most Davy Jones scenes take place at night, so it always looks like the strange Lovecraftian elements of his design are coming out of the darkness. But even during the day, he looks great, because the inspiration behind his design and the design of his crew, that they are people made out of sea creatures and plants, fits within the context of the scene. They don't look out of place on the deck of a boat or in a storm or anything by the ocean. And even when the film puts him in an environment that he should look weird in, they manage to make it all look like it coheres with stark lighting choices. Like Davy Jones should look really out of place at fancy British tea time, but he doesn't because the stark yellow lighting makes him and the human characters all blend into a single image. The thing is though, there was a cost to these movies looking this good. In the past year or so, there have been a number of reports about the poor working conditions for most of the people in the VFX industry. Stories which came out alongside widespread criticisms of the quality of the CGI in a number of different movies and TV shows, such as Marvel's She-Hulk. There are a bunch of factors that have created these conditions. First, the consolidation of Hollywood studios means that each individual studio has a lot more bargaining power when it comes to making demands of VFX artists. Most VFX artists work on a freelance basis with the studios, and so they are in constant fear of alienating a client and losing out on all of their work. This means that movie studios like Marvel can make outrageous demands of VFX artists, expecting them to work on unrealistic schedules and to make enormous changes late into the process, something they are notorious for. The VFX studios are also in competition with one another to secure contracts with the movie studios, so they have to underbid one another, meaning that the margins are very thin or non-existent. The majority of VFX workers are thus both underpaid and overworked. When you multiply this all by the fact that the number of projects that need major VFX work has exploded over the past decade, you've got an industry that is at a breaking point. To give you a picture of just how bad it is, almost every studio has some sort of cry room where people would just go into and cry for 10 minutes and then come back out and do their job. That quote is from an io9 article that includes anonymous interviews with a number of VFX workers on the issue. One of the artists specifically identified Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End as a flashpoint for the industry. Disney made increasingly huge demands on the VFX studios, who managed to pull off the project despite the massive time crunch. A lot of us in the industry saw that as a really bad thing because we recognized that we were never going to get more than this amount of money and this amount of resources resources because they finished the Pirates of the Caribbean, and that's exactly what happened. So look, I hope my love for these movies is coming through, but obviously it's also hard to know that something I'm attached to was also objectively bad for a generation of VFX artists. The movie looks incredible, but I'd take a worse looking blockbuster movie about silly pirates if it meant an industry that had healthy working conditions for the people involved. Right now though, we've got both an industry with unhealthy working conditions and a tsunami of movies and TV shows with subpar effects. It's the worst of both worlds. And to be totally clear, it's not the case that the people working on the shows that come out today are somehow less talented than the ones that came out years prior. It's that they're not given the proper time to do their best work. And that's the worst case scenario for everyone involved, except for the big studios. As I'm writing this, both the Actors Union and the Writers Union are on strike, while VFX artists at Marvel and Disney have voted to unionize. I hope they succeed. And if you do too, then, well, there's not much you can do, but the least you can do is not take to social media to blame underpaid workers when your favorite thing gets delayed by a couple of months. Blame the studios instead. Taking a look back at the Pirates trilogy today is a wild experience. It feels like those movies came out at a focal point for a lot of different trends that have robbed the industry of a lot of the life that it once had. They were movies that were everything at once. Action, comedy, horror, romance, adventures. But... It really was just those three first movies. There's no chance of me doing a reanalysis of the fourth or fifth films because the main reason those movies don't work is simple. They weren't directed by Gore Verbinski. Gore Verbinski is a pretty interesting director, and in doing the research for this video, I dived into his entire filmography, a filmography which hasn't had a new entry in seven years. So I've actually made a whole second video about his movies. It's called Whatever Happened to Gore Verbinski. This is a full 30 minute long video essay that I'm really proud of. And if you've enjoyed this video, I think you'll get a lot out of that one. And you can watch it right now on Nebula.
If you don't know, Nebula is a fantastic streaming service that I helped make with a bunch of other educational YouTubers that you're probably familiar with. It's a place where we can make videos that don't have to worry about the YouTube algorithm or getting demonetized. For instance, Maggie Mayfish recently made a fantastic Nebula original series called Unrated that explores the history of sexuality on film. You can watch all of that good stuff for an absurdly low price. If you sign up with my link, you can get 40% off of an annual plan of Nebula, which works out to a little over $2.50 a month? I mean, come on. On top of that, you'll get access to Nebula classes, like this one by my friend Patrick H. Willems, which is a practical tutorial to becoming a filmmaker. Also, for the month of September only, Nebula has a lifetime membership deal. Ooh, what's that? Well, for $300, you can have access to Nebula forever. Yes forever. This is the best way to support creators on that platform because one third of the money goes directly to supporting this channel while the rest of it goes to the development of more Nebula originals. You can save more money by getting an annual plan, but you can help make Nebula a better platform today with a lifetime membership. So give it a look with the other link I've shared below. A big thank you to everyone who has already signed up for Nebula and another big thanks to my patrons for supporting me on Patreon. Keep writing everyone. Ha <laughs> ha